she sang. She sang with a volume and pitch and a heartbreaking wail that echoed through her relatives' bones, rattling them in the ground under the school itself, wave after wave, changing her heartbeat to drum, morphing her singular voice to many, pulling every dream from her own marrow and into her song. And there were words, words in the language that the conductor couldn't process, words the cardinals couldn't bear, words the wires couldn't transfer. I just finished The Marrow Thieves a few weeks ago, and I have to say that while young adult fiction is not my favorite genre to read for my personal pleasure, it was an eye-opener for me to see what young adult literature can do and the discussions that it can open up for us. Mostly what I want to talk about today is the classroom application of The Marrow Thieves and some of the main themes and ideas that come out in the story. This story shares many of the elements of young adult literature that I've taken a look at. The narrative voice was very familiar. First person, adolescent, who's coming of age in a dystopian, and in this case, post-apocalyptic world. The story wasted no time in setting the tone and the dangerous terrain in which the children are suddenly parentless while being pursued by malevolent adults. As the story opens, the protagonist, Frenchie, loses his brother to the recruiters, and he must then set out on his own. His brother, Mitch, sacrifices himself in that moment so that Frenchie can escape. I decided just to give a brief synopsis here of the main plot points, followed by commentary on how this novel can be used as an asset to my curriculum. The uniqueness of this novel among many teen dystopias is the identity of Frenchie as a Native American. This identity provides ample opportunities to explore the historical atrocities committed by the culture of power in the United States and Canada. As the narrative takes place in the not-so-distant future, I feel that more students are going to be interested in reading it. The apocalypse has been brought on by climate change, which has ravaged the entire continent. Yet, the story is deeply embedded with indigenous history and conflicts with cultural genocide. The dominant culture has suffered great losses, including the ability to dream. Somehow, it becomes known that indigenous peoples are still able to dream. The antagonists in the story believe that this special quality can be found in the marrow of their bones. Consequently, they set up residential schools, which clearly are an allusion to the institutions of forced assimilation in the 1800s across the United States and Canada. Not only games and tradition, but the mastery of words. The main character, Frenchie, has never seen a residential school, has only been told about them by his older relatives. We also learn from the story that Frenchie, like many of his peers, are no longer possessors of their language meaning the language is relegated to elders in the community and maybe a few specialists. But in this story, Frenchie is exposed to the power of his indigenous tongue. Before losing his father, he's told that he should flee to the north where there is rumors of settlements of indigenous peoples in some sort of resistance to the recruiters. And of course, along the way, Frenchie meets allies, and these allies, of course, shed further insight on the atrocities. Now, I chose Marrow Thieves as my selected text, primarily because of my work with indigenous people of Hawaii. Since moving to the islands, I have been searching for literature that reflects the memory and experience of my students. Hawaiians share many of the troubling historical atrocities of Native Americans. 
Although there are some important differences as well. Hawaiians can make the claim of establishing an internationally recognized monarchy prior to American annexation, which most consider illegal. I have found that my Kanaka Native Hawaiian students and other marginalized groups in Hawaii tend to resonate with the narratives that mirror their own experience. This would be one book I would be happy to introduce to my class. It provides several perennial issues such as climate change, racism, indigenous cultural genocide, LGBTQ issues, and as well as gender issues. One of the main characters in the story is gay and it's presented in a matter-of-fact way which flows easily into the narrative. I think this novel has a very fast pace which most young readers are going to enjoy. It has some pretty edgy dialogue and content which I think they also will enjoy. It moves quickly, it pulls you in. Some of the aspects of this novel uh, are very formulaic but this is to be expected in the young adult genre. There are many places in The Marrow Thieves where discussions could be had on language variation. For example, there are many references to dialect and indigenous language in The Marrow Thieves. Uh, here's one quote from a time where Frenchy is, has been on his own for quite some time and he awakens to the sound of voices that are familiar to him. Voices with the pulled vowels and cut lilt of my father. Voices with the low music of my mother. And of course, as a young adult novel, there is a love interest in this story. And of course, there are tensions in that love interest with competition and typical teenage struggles. Much of this narrative I felt was a primer to be made for a movie, including the ending, which leads off with plenty of room for sequels. The Marrow Thieves provides plenty of opportunities to explore language and literary devices. Stars were perforations, revealing the bleached skeleton of the universe through a collection of tiny holes. And surrounded by these silent trees, beside a calming fire, I watched the bones dance. This was our medicine, these bones, and I opened up and took it all in and dreamed of North." Unquote. Another character in the story becomes a mentor to Frenchie is Midge. He mentions a lot about the cultural genocide that had taken place in previous generations for Native Americans, which also mirrors the genocide that is taking place currently in the story. Here's a quote about what had happened in the past. Quote, But we lost a lot, mostly because we got sick with new germs. And then when we were on our knees with fever and pukes, they decided that they liked us there, on our knees. And that's when they opened the first schools. We suffered there. We almost lost our languages. Many lost their innocence, their laughter, and their lives." Unquote. In a now famous quote by Captain Richard H. Pratt on the education of Native Americans, he said, quote, kill the Indian and save the man, unquote. Such sentiments can be used in the classroom today to discuss cultural genocide. There are many references to it in this book that are based on historical fact. In one scene, Midge is explaining to Frenchie about his husband and how his husband did not understand what the schooling uh, did with cultural genocide. Here's a quote. Isaac didn't have memories of his family, of the original schools, the ones that pulled themselves up like wooden monsters coming to attention across the land back in the 1800s, monsters who stayed there, ingesting our children like sweet berries, one after the other, for over a hundred years. This mentor character Midge also talks to Frenchie about the power of story in indigenous culture. He also talks about the themes of nature and how the indigenous peoples understood to be in harmony with their environment. The following quote addresses the issues of ecological sustainability directly related to unheeded indigenous wisdom. It also makes references to current events like Standing Rock. Here's the quote. 
And all those pipelines in the ground, they snapped like icicles and spewed bile over forests into lakes, drowning whole reserves and towns, so much laid to waste from the miscalculation of infallibility in the face of a planet's revolt. Cultural appropriation is also addressed in The Marrow Thieves. The following quote covers a very powerful moment in which New Age spirituality is seen as being participants in cultural appropriation. Here the character is speaking about what had happened after the Earth could no longer sustain human activity. At first, people turned to indigenous people the way the New Agers had, all reverence and curiosity, looking for ways we could help guide them. They asked to come to ceremony. They humbled themselves when we refused. And then they changed on us, like the New Agers, looking for ways they could take what we had and administer it themselves. How could they best appropriate the uncanny ability we kept to dream? How could they make ceremony better, more efficient, more economical? Another very interesting concept in the book is bone marrow itself. And there are many ways to think about why the author chose bone marrow as the means by which the non-indigenous group seeks to save themselves. I believe Sherry Dimeline makes for a few connections, one of which is cultural appropriation. In this case, the author refers, as I mentioned earlier, to New Age movements, mostly made up of white people that find resonance with indigenous wisdom, but turn around and commodify it for their own proprietary purposes. It is this part of a cultural appropriation that's in the Marrow Thieves I find very useful in my own context here in Hawaii. There are multiple examples of this sort of uh, borrowing from indigenous wisdom and commodifying it. I'll give you three. The first is known as Huna. Huna is simply the Hawaiian word for secret, but it has been appropriated and used by New Agers for quite some time. Inside of this concept is Ho'oponopono, which in very simple terms means forgiveness, but it's a process in Hawaiian culture that it has been appropriated. New Agers have long found Hawaii to be a repository of metaphysical knowledge. In the 1930s, Max Freedom Long, who is not a Hawaiian, developed a series of teachings called Huna, which means secret in Hawaiian. It is saddening and maddening to see seminars and products being sold worldwide which have little or nothing to do with actual Hawaiian cultural practices. Another act of cultural appropriation is with the simple word aloha. This beautiful and common greeting in Hawaii has itself been commodified and thereby changed its meaning. It has been watered down to simply meaning hello and goodbye or love. Many also describe it as being kind to one another. While these meanings are true, when decontextualized from the Hawaiian worldview, they often have a sinister effect of deculturalization in the tourist industry. And one final example in Hawaii with cultural appropriation is yoga. Hawaii is paradise and a magnet for double commodification of cultural appropriation, in this case, Hindu and Hawaiian. A lot of money is made and a lot of things are simply made up. Stand up paddleboard yoga, which is pretty cool as an exercise in balance and mindfulness. I can see my students having robust conversations about this issue and finding similarities in the Marrow Thieves. There is a chapter in the book called Not Every Indian is an Indian. One of the key points the author makes is not every Indian is an Indian. Now implicit in this, you could also say that not every non-Indian is a non-Indian as well. By this, I believe that Dimaline is addressing both internalized colonization and a broader appeal to humanization and critical consciousness. Although cultural appropriation is real and dangerous, this does not mean that indigenous wisdom is exclusive. However, those seeking such knowledge must do so with humility and submit themselves to the contextual authorities of particular cultures. Essentially, wisdom is the inheritance of all peoples 
but it is not something simply to be extracted in an objectified way. Bone marrow is an interesting choice by the author. Perhaps this is because it is in the marrow that stem cells and blood cells are produced. Modern practices rely on bone marrow transplants to treat things like cancer. However, in this process there must be a match to be successful. I'm not sure how much of this the author had in mind, but I suspect that she was thinking about it. I also was interested in the fact that we hardly see the marrow thieves in the story itself. Rather, it's within the context of their domination that the conflict plays out. I'm thinking that this relates to the pervasiveness of dominant culture ideology and the hidden curriculum. I mentioned in my first post with my group that I think this novel may have been written with larger objectives in mind, and forgive me if I'm wrong, but it seems to have series written all over it, and we may see more of Marrow Thieves in subsequent books and perhaps major motion pictures. But don't get me wrong, I would be very excited if this does happen. 